Welcome to another episode from Catholic Perseverance. Today we are looking at, what's so great about Catholicism? Family life. Catholicism made family life important in a way that it wasn't in previous history. Indeed, the family came to be viewed for the first time as the central venue for the fulfillment of life's main satisfactions. This change began with the elevation of marriage to a Catholic sacrament. Catholicism developed a new notion of romantic love, which is today one of the most powerful forces in our civilization. While marriages continue to be arranged in the West, especially among the more affluent classes, a new and alternative ideal emerged in the Middle Ages. This was the idea of love as the basis for getting married and also for preserving a happy marriage. We are not saying that people did not fall in love before the medieval era. But falling in love was previously considered a mild form of insanity. Something that should not be the basis for an enduring marriage. The medieval Catholics began to understand marriage between a man and a woman as a relationship similar to that between Christ and the Church. The Bible portrays this relationship as intimate and passionate, certainly not as some kind of a mercenary bargain. So Catholics began to view marriage as an intimate companionship enlivened by romantic passion. Romantic love is today in our secular Western culture considers love as little more than a feeling, but that is a pale shadow of its original meaning. It was meant to be the culmination of a quest, to represent the high ideals of personal sacrifice and service to another. Catholicism introduced consent on the part of both the man and the woman as the prerequisite for marriage. Again we take this for granted today, but you have to only go to Asia, Africa, or the Middle East to see that people there are frequently pressured into marriage against their will, especially in Muslim countries. In the West however, since the early days of Catholicism, has had marriage by choice and mutual agreement. Catholicism emphasized that free choice should also be binding choice. As we have consented without coercion, we should live up to our vows and preserve marriage as a lifelong commitment made only between a man and a woman. Capitalism Catholicism enhanced the notion of political and social accountability by providing a new model. That of servant leadership. In ancient Greece or Rome, nobody would have dreamed of considering political leaders anyone's servants. The job of a leader was to lead. Jesus invented the notion that the way to lead is by serving the needs of others, especially those who are most needy. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Mark 10 43 Who is greatest, the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Luke 22 27 In this new Catholic framework, leaders are judged by how well they respond to the concerns and welfare of the people. Over time, people once known as followers, or subjects became customers and constituents. As a consequence, the job of leaders, the merchant, and priest becomes serving the people. Political, material, and spiritual. From this the system of modern capitalism arose. Capitalism satisfied the Christian demand for an institution that channels selfish human desire toward the betterment of society. Some critics accuse capitalism as being a selfish system, but the selfishness is not in the capitalism, it's in the human nature. The effect of capitalism is to steer human selfishness so that, through the invisible hand of competition, the energies of the capitalist produce the abundance, from which the whole of society benefits. Capitalism encourages entrepreneurs to act with consideration for others, even when their ultimate motive, is to benefit themselves. 
So while profit remains the final goal, entrepreneurs spend their time figuring out how to better serve the needs of their actual and potential customers. Charities A Catholic Legacy The emphasis of compassion, helping the needy, and alleviating distress in distant places. It is interesting to note, if there is a huge famine, or reports of genocide in places such as Africa, or war such as the conflict currently going on in Ukraine. Most people in other countries are unconcerned. A famous Chinese proverb. The tears of a stranger are only water. But here in the West, massive relief programs are organized. Sometimes military intervention is organized to stop the killing. Those people are human like us. They too deserve a chance to live their lives without famine, ill health, war or persecution. If we are more fortunate than they are, we should help in any way we can to improve their situation. The ancient Romans and Greeks did not hold this belief at all. They held a view that remains quite common today in many countries. Yes that is a problem, but it's not our problem. Aristotle, who came close to the Christian view, wrote that the great souled man does in fact assist those in need. But in Aristotle's view, this is done out of liberality, in order to demonstrate his magnanimity and even superiority to those beneath him. Ancient nobles and aristocrats funded baths, statues and parks that predominantly bore their names and testified to their greatness. A form of virtue signaling. Something we see commonly in places today with celebrities in Hollywood for example, who love to virtue signal. This is not the Catholic view, which demands compassion, which means suffering with others. We help the victims in Ukraine for example, not to show how virtuous we are, but because we have a genuine love for our fellow man in need. Catholic humility is the very opposite of classical magnanimity, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew 6 2 Hospitals In the West Catholics built the first hospitals. At first they were for just Christians, but eventually they were open to everyone. Even Muslims who entered Christian lands with the aim of conquest. Today many hospitals have Christian names. St. John of God S. Hospital, St. Luke's Hospital, St. Anne's Hospital, Mercy Hospital, and so on. Not to mention the relief organizations such as St. Vincent de Paul, Salvation Army, Red Cross and so on, all originate from Christian roots. So do organizations such as YMCA, Rotary Club, are involved in charitable activities originating from Christianity. Catholicism has produced many great figures from St. Vincent de Paul to Mother Teresa, all who have dedicated their lives to the service of the sick, poor and needy. Nowhere else, not in other religions nor in secular society, do we find anything similar to this? We must realize that prior to Christianity, taking care and showing empathy for someone you did not know was a strange thing, and certainly not the norm in any society. One does not have to be a Christian or even a believer to acknowledge that this Western faith has done an incredible amount to improve human life and reduce human suffering. Before Christianity, there was virtually no institutional interest in helping the poor, the sick, the mentally ill, the disabled, the elderly, and the dying. In the year 369, Saint Basil of Caesarea founded a 300-bed hospital. The first large-scale hospital for the sick and disabled in the world. After this Catholic hospitals started springing up all over Western Europe. These were civilization's first voluntary charitable institutions, and were paid for and built by the Catholic Church. 
Christ said that a tree is known by its fruit. If the Catholic religion is seen by many groups in society as terrible, how could its fruit be so bountiful and beneficial? Schools and Universities The Greeks and Romans had no public schools of higher learning. It was Christianity who established formal education. When the Huns, Goths, Vandals, Visigoths, and other barbarian tribes overran what was left of the Roman Empire, it was Christianity that took what was left of the European continent and imposed learning, order, and stability upon it. In the so-called Dark Ages, it was Christianity again who painstakingly preserved, copied, and studied manuscripts from antiquity in order to pass them on to future generations. Christianity, therefore, was responsible for the Renaissance, otherwise known as the rebirth of Greek and Roman culture. Now, if the Catholic religion had really been so opposed to critical thinking, why in the world would it have acted so decisively to protect and preserve the writings of Plato, Aristotle, and other pagan philosophers? Why wouldn't Christians have burned them on a bonfire, as atheists claim they are so fond of doing to books that contradict the faith? It was the monastery system of the Catholic Church that maintained the intellectual culture of the West for hundreds of years and gave birth to the first universities and libraries. These great institutions spread throughout Europe and provided a systematic, as well as integrated, form of public education for the masses. Christianity brought in the compulsory education of boys and girls. This again was a radically new idea. It is no surprise that 122 out of 123 colleges in colonial America were founded as Christian institutions, including Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Morality Morality is both natural and universal. It is discoverable without religion, yet its source is ultimately divine. Darwinist attempts to give a purely secular explanation of morality are a failure. And each of us knows, however disingenuously we deny it, that there are absolute standards of right and wrong, and these are precisely the standards we use to judge how other people treat us. It is not Christian morality that is the obstacle to our freedom, it is conscience itself, the judge within. The atheist objection is not to morality but to absolute morality. Rather than deriving morality from an external code of divine commandments, atheists think of morality as man-made, something forged through individual and group experience. Novelist Evelyn Waugh once responded to the question how can a Catholic like you be so debauched and spiteful? The answer being, think how much worse I would be if I were not a Catholic. We believe we can know scientific things, but morality is a matter of mere opinion. On this basis we can say things like don't impose your beliefs on me, while it would never occur to us to say don't impose your algebra on me. When people deny absolute morality, they are engaging in a rhetorical strategy in order to undermine some particular moral belief you hold and they don't. Liberals, for example, often discuss topics like drugs, pornography, and prostitution by saying how can you impose your beliefs on me or others? Who is to say what's is right? They seem to be denying absolute morality. If they are not self-aware, they might even believe this. The existence of a universal, absolute morality is a powerful argument for the existence of God. If there are moral laws that operate beyond the realm of natural laws, where do these laws come from? Moral laws presume a moral lawgiver. In other words, God is the ultimate standard of good. He is responsible for the distinction between good and evil that we universally perceive as binding on human action. The fact that these standards are distinctive to human beings implies that there is something special about us, and that God has a special interest in how we live. We will conclude this video by saying that there are many other reasons why Catholicism is amazing, 
we have only mentioned a few. Be sure to like, subscribe and share this video. Thank you for watching.